It's ridiculous. Spoilers, this is not a new favorite. I guess it's better if someone likes a book. A YA romance Trojan horse. I don't like that. I don't know how I feel about that. I read everything on my March TBR and then some. This happened partly because I was sick. So I just like binged a bunch of audiobooks when I was sick, but it's, it's ridiculous. So yeah, uh, the final count I believe is 21 books if I counted correctly, which I, uh, okay, it's, it is what it is. <laughs> I, I, this is not my goal for the year. I'm trying to read less. Ugh. The first book that I read in March was a reread and that was Last Argument of Kings by Joe Evercrombie. Because as you should know, we are doing a read along of the first law universe, all of the first law books on Bethany's podcast, chapter three podcast. So we did Last Argument of Kings, uh, finished out the trilogy in March. And if the one, if you want to see the podcast episode for it, which is mostly spoilery, it is a little bit non-spoilery in the beginning, but mostly spoilery, then I'll leave that link down below. I've talked about First Law to death on my channel, so. I read some more, well, not more, just read First Law again, as I want to do. Um, so that was a nice way to start the month. Then the next book that I read was a big surprise. Well, me reading it wasn't a surprise. It's uh, how much I liked it that was a surprise. And that is Jade City by Fonda Lee. Jade City by Fonda Lee. I am obsessed. I did film uh, an entire review for it. It is non-spoiler. So uh, I'll leave that linked down below as well if you missed it or are interested in it. I binged this book. I'm obsessed with this book. This is my entire personality now. I mean, starting the month out with Last Argument of Kings and Jade City, like it really could only go downhill from there, right? Because Joe Abercrombie and First Law is already like God tier. And then a new obsession worthy favorite back to back. What I'm trying to say is that the reading month started out very strong. And there were there were ups and downs. It wasn't all downhill from there, but like, damn son, damn. The next book I read is a book that I cannot tell you what I think of uh, because it is one of the books that Hillary chose for me. So you'll have to wait until we do the live shows, discuss the books she picked for me on her channel and the books that I picked for her on my channel. The live shows are now scheduled for the Monday and Tuesday, this, this, <laughs> the 11th and 12th if that's Monday and Tuesday of April. Uh, I, I believe we're doing the show on her channel about the books that I read first. So you'll have to wait until Monday the 11th, but um, Warbreaker by Brandon Sanderson is one of the books she chose for me. And it is the third book that I read in March. Yeah, you'll just have to tune in to see what I think about it. Next up is a book that <laughs> I have a whole video for, and this was not originally on my TBR at all, but Bethany specifically sent me this book for the express purpose of having me film a boozy vlog reading it. And that is Ice Planet Barbarians by Ruby Dixon. So I did, per her request, I spent an entire, I think it was a Saturday, drinking and reading Ice Planet Barbarians. And that video is available to you to watch if you want to see that journey. But uh, spoilers, this is not a new favorite. <laughs> Next up is a reread that I very much enjoyed the second time. Uh, and that is Angela's Ashes by Frank McCord. This used to be my official favorite book. I stopped saying that just because it no longer felt quite true. There's so many books that I love that I didn't really feel comfortable saying this is my favorite book of all time anymore, but it is certainly a favorite book and it's, it is wonderful. And rereading it now, I was also, I was like, it had been a while too. It was just another reason I stopped saying it as I was like, I'm not even confident that, that is still true. Like I remember it fondly, but what if I don't think that anymore? So anyway, uh, this is Frank McCord's memoirs about his extremely impoverished childhood in Ireland. And it is every bit as charmingly heartbreaking and heartbreakingly charming as I remember. Frank McCord just has a way with words. And I absolutely recommend listening to an audiobook. The first time I ever read this, I read it physically. Um, and then I listened to like part of it on audio a few years ago. Uh, I was listening to it with my parents in the car on a road trip, but we didn't listen to the whole, whole thing. Um, and then now I did it completely on audio and Frank McCourt reads it himself. So it's, it just feels like having this like sort of elderly Irish man tell you his life story uh, with all of the like humor, wit, and like quirks of like dialectic speech that, uh, that you could wish for. And he sings all the songs and it's just... I mean, it's very tragic, uh, his life, but you know, it's all, he kind of tells it from the perspective of how he as a child understood what was going on around him, that what, how he was making sense of things around him. So that is funny. <laughs> like you understand the things that the child does not understand and that Frank McCourt obviously now as an adult understands, but didn't as a child. And what's going on is horrible and <laughs> tragic, but little Frank's understanding of it all the understanding is able to cobble together based on experience and what adults are willing to tell a child um, is pretty hilarious. <laughs> so anyway, if you have any interest in this at all, I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, and again, 
definitely recommend it on audio. Next up is another book that Hillary chose for me, so you're just gonna have to wait to find out. Um, but that was Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay, which is a collection of essays by Roxane Gay, all to do with feminism, feministy feministings. <laughs> so, uh, You'll just, you'll just have to tune in, see what I thought. It's gonna be a nice short wrap up. Next up is a book that we talked about for hours. Um, and that is A Night of the Seven Kingdoms by George R. R. Martin. I read this as part of the A Song of Ice and Fire read along that I have been co-hosting with Jimmy from the Fantasy Network, Fantasy Nut Work, and Alex from Alex Niemis. We talked about this on Jimmy's channel. This is a collection of three novella short stories that are, they take place in the world of A Song of Ice and Fire and they follow Sir Dunk the Tall and egg his squire they were there i mean for for a song of ice and fire they're quite charming and sweet but they are still a song of ice and fire story so they, there's quite a bit of violence and darkness in them as well just for the world of game of thrones that we've all come to be familiar with it's it feels light and charming and fairy tale-esque compared to that and it's meant to be it's a it's a very sweet collection and i enjoyed it and i think i'd like to reread it more in the future because i know we talked about this a lot on the live that if you missed it you know the replay is available on jimmy's channel but just sort of like all of the ways it, it is does connect to lineages and family names and events in the main series like either people that have been mentioned in the main series or that are descendants of people from these stories or things like that the way it's connected i know a lot of that like missed it so to me was kind enough to like explain a lot of it but i think this is a fun collection to kind of dip in and out of and come back to and read it just kind of as stories um the way you would just like a book of a book of folk tales uh, they're not they're, it's not quite like folk tales but it's a bit more that vibe than the full novels are so i had a good time with this and also this this edition and i think all the editions i have no idea but this edition anyway i can bounce for this is illustrated and the illustrations are fantastic Oh, and the audiobook is read by Harry Lloyd, who is the actor who plays Viserys. Um, and his narration is quite good. The next book I read, I loathed and despised, but luckily, so did my reading buddy. Or unluckily, I guess it's better if someone likes a book, but we didn't disagree. That was More Due by Alex uh, Phoebe. Actually, I think, so uh, this book was sent to me very kindly by uh, Evie from She Was Only Evie, so that we could buddy read this. And we've been planning to buddy read this for a really long time so we're finally we finally did it evie really really hated it i really did not like it um i think actually maybe she gave it two stars and i, I gave it one star but nevertheless i feel like she hated it more but she did make allowances for like oh maybe it's not for me maybe it's you know brilliant and i don't get it whereas i was just like no i i did not enjoy this like at all and it's this is a definitely a situation where i have often talked about books and stories where it feels like the author is intentionally making things either like complicated or convoluted or just throwing stuff at you because they feel like to disguise the fact that their story isn't actually that good or that complex. So it seems really complicated because there's just like all this stuff. But when you actually strip all that back, it's actually a very straightforward story that they could have told in a much simpler way, but they made it bananas. <laughs> um, So like I compared, I think it's actually a pretty good read alike for the what's it called? Sendlin Ascends. I haven't read the rest of the works, but the sort of the quirkiness of the writing style and the quirkiness of the world building. The thing that it most reminded me of was Sendlin Ascends. But I think Sendlin Ascends is a better book. I know Ellen likes to hate me for the fact that I gave that book only three stars, but I gave this, I, I can't remember now if I gave it one or two stars, but I don't like this. And I thought Sendlin was like, okay. Uh, it didn't blow my mind. But if you adore the, just like the quirky world building and the quirky writing style of Sendlin, you'll probably like this but this was definitely a situation where I felt like once you strip back the bizarreness of the world and how many made-up words there are and how complicated he makes it understand because it, it's not a situation where like I like a book that organically gives you world building pieces so that you can pick it up from context clues but you also don't do that by just like basically making every other word a made-up word so that you cannot understand what's happening most of the time unless you check the glossary which the author specifically tells you you shouldn't check the glossary because it's spoilery so you're just like well fuck so it just it just feels like it's in love with its own bizarreness and complicatedness and if you again if you strip all that back when you actually sit down and like write an outline of like, like what was this story about it's not about a whole lot it's not a very complicated story but there's just like so much wibbly wobbly weirdness going on that you're like, what the fuck is going on the most of the time? And I, there was at the core of it, something of a cool idea, something of a cool, interesting thing to do here. But he just, uh, it felt very masturbatory. So yeah, it's a no from me. Next up was my book of the month club book. And that was A River Enchanted by Rebecca Ross. Um, this I, I really did not like either. And I think that this is utterly mismarketed and miscategorized. This is sold as adult 
fantasy. And that's, I mean, it's book of the month. Book of the month club books now are pretty much, the, any of the ones that are like of the month uh, that are not add-ons are meant to be adult. And this is published as adult fantasy. Like it's not like book of the month made a mistake. This is this author's first adult fantasy book. She was previously writing YA fantasy, which like, I mean, that's fine. Like you can switch. Other authors have done it to great success. But this, I'm sorry, it reads not only like YA, because it definitely reads more like YA than adult. It reads like a YA romance, not a YA fantasy even. So I picked this up expecting an adult fantasy and I got instead a YA romance. And if I had been sold to me as a YA romance, I simply would not have picked it up and we could have avoided all of this. So I'm very irritated because it was misrepresented to me. And again, if you enjoy YA and you enjoy romance, then more power to you. And I just know not to pick that up because that's not something that I am interested in picking up. But it, this, it feels like a, a YA romance Trojan horse. <laughs> like it was disguising itself as adult fantasy to trick you into reading it. And I, I did not enjoy it because those are stories that I do not pick up if I can avoid it. And I don't think it was very well written. And I don't think, because I could like a cheesy romance too now and again. But this just, it wasn't even very interesting or very original or even that like dramatic or swoon worthy. Like it wasn't like filled with melodrama that I was just like rolling my eyes at. There was just like nothing to this, honestly. It was the one of the most hollow reading experiences I've ever had in my life. So I do not recommend this. <laughs> Next up is a book that I do not have a physical copy of. I got the audio of it from the library and that is Rizzio by Denise Mina. I talked about it at some length um, in the vlog that I did for Atlas Six because I talked about a bunch of books that I read that week. And this is a novella that is part of a larger project is my understanding where a bunch of authors are retelling events from Scottish history in different ways. So Rizzio is just a little novella that is just retelling um, the events surrounding the murder of David Rizzio, um, who was the confidant of Mary Queen of Scots. And I thought it was pretty good. Like I did enjoy reading this or listening to it, but I did feel like one, I don't think it works as a novella. It feels like a slice out of a longer book. Like it doesn't feel like it's a contained story with a beginning and an end that is like fine at this length. Like what was written was well written, but it felt like it had been excerpted out of a longer book. So I just don't think that worked as like an isolated, like if you wanted to make this just about that, I, I don't know, it didn't, it felt like you jumped in the middle and you had like missed the beginning. And then another part of it, that might be why I would say it's really, it would be difficult to understand this book if you don't know anything about the circumstances because we do just sort of like dive into the events just about as they are happening with very little setup and very little explanation and, and then dip out of them pretty quickly as well. Cause it's just really about his murder and kind of the events surrounding that quite immediately before and immediately after. Um, and then the end of it is is different. <laughs> that like epilogue or last chapter is different. Um, but if you don't know anything about Mary Queen of Scots or anything about her life or about these events, I, I think you'll be super, super confused. I knew a little bit. So I was okay. It really expects you to know. So I don't think it really works on its own either as a novella, even if you know what's going on. And I don't think it works on its own. It definitely doesn't work on its own in terms of people not knowing these sort of historical events and just picking the up this book fresh with no, no no prior knowledge. So I think it's good. Like it's well written and it was compellingly written. And I did like the ending, um, which I understand is a little bit um, divisive. So like I recommend it, but with like multiple asterisks. If you're already interested in this and like go in forewarned that this will feel incomplete, um, but if it still interests you, it is good, it's well written. So I would recommend it. Next up, I read a book that I loved. And that was Beautiful World, Where Are You by Sally Rooney. I am given to understand that Sally Rooney is also quite divisive. Um, I loved Normal People, which I read, um, not when it came out, but I read it a while ago now. And um, as soon as I heard she had another book coming out, I was like, yep, getting that. I binge listened to this when I was sick and it was, it was great. It was less depressing than Normal People, which was refreshing. It's not a happy book. I don't want to mischaracterize it. I don't think Sally Rooney is capable of writing a happy book, but it is happier than Normal People. <laughs> Um, I, her writing style really, really, really works for me. Um, I do kind of get why it wouldn't necessarily work for you. And I definitely would bug me, um, the no quotation marks thing that she does. I discovered very quickly with normal people that she does this no quotation marks thing that irks me. So I did normal people on audio so that I could avoid looking at a page that had no quotation marks. And so I already knew she's like that. So I didn't even consider reading this physically. I was like, I will be doing it on audio so that I can not be aware of the lack of quotation marks. So if that's something that's going to bug you, I recommend doing Sally Rooney on audio. <laughs> but yeah, I uh, I mean, a lot of people who do like her have sort of said that she's sort of a voice of a gener the voice of the her generation. To a greater or lesser degree, I think that's earned. That doesn't mean that you have to like 
her voice. <laughs> You're like, you don't have to like Billie Eilish's music, but Billie Eilish uh, and the style of her music, the content of it, and she as a persona is very emblematic of that generation. So you don't have to like it, <laughs> but it, it is pretty true. So I do think that there's a good reason Sally Rooney has that reputation. Um, and also this book was quite, you know, um, relevant. Um, it felt quite a sort of hit because um, she was writing this, I think she finished writing it as the pandemic began. So she actually does bring up the pandemic in towards the end of this book. So yeah, it just feels very, it, this book feels very now. I do wonder how I'll, how I or anyone will feel about it 10 years from now, 20 years from now, because it, this book is so now, like the existential questions and the, the zeitgeist and the way that people are connecting or not connecting with each other. Um, and then the pandemic, like everything about this book almost feels like a, like a time capsule. So in that sense, it might be very interesting to look back on in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now, as just like a snapshot of the cultural feeling and emotional state of youngish people at this time. Anyway, I enjoyed it. Not everyone does, apparently. Next up is another book that I binge listened to while I was sick, and that was A Good Marriage by Kimberly McCrate, which is a book of the month club book that I got a long time ago. When I was sick and looking at all my unread books, I just went to my library app and got whatever audiobooks were immediately available of books that I owned and had not read yet. Um, and so I listened to this all in one day. Uh, it's a mystery thriller, and it's not the best thing that I've ever read, you know, by no means, but it kept my interest, um, and it definitely, you know, passed the time while I was sick. I think I gave it four stars. I'm not much of a reader of thrillers and mysteries, so, like, I don't, I'm not an expert on the genre. Perhaps this is extremely formulaic, and anyone who is a veteran of the genre would guess all the twists a million miles away. I'm not a veteran of the genre, so the twists kept surprising me. I also was very sick, so it wasn't on firing at all cylinders either, maybe, but, uh, it kept me interested and and curious and and fascinated and the ending wasn't I didn't fully love the ending like the the answer to everything about what had been going on but overall I found it quite satisfying and surprising and interesting and compelling so I would generally recommend this if you're looking for an interesting thriller to read in a day next up is a book that unfortunately I cannot recommend and I really thought that it would be a book that I would love. And that is Ray Mirror by Jordan Fuego. And I have this gorgeous edition of it. Um, that is a special edition of it. I have the matching special edition for the sequel that I now do not intend to read. I really thought that I would love this book. I thought that I would love the sequel. Uh, that's why I have both. It's a duology, I believe. Um, there's gonna be more than that. I mean, obviously I'm not gonna read them. I listened to this while I was sick because my hold for it finally came in and I was like, yeah, let's do it. I'm laying here in bed and I need something to listen to. And this book is, uh, how did I describe it? So when I, I talked about this at, at length in the vlog during which I read this. Um, and basically the only way I can think to describe this book is like, and I said this in the vlog, so this will be a repeat for anyone to watch that. It's like if you go to a buffet, but a buffet for character magic themes, you know, world building, all of that. And like a starving person in a buffet, you just put everything that sounds good to you and looks good to you and crowd it onto your plate. But then that plate is being served as like a prepared, intentionally paired entree. And no, a lot of things look and taste good. A lot of things are interesting. You cannot put them all in one book. This book is just trying to do so many things all of the time and not doing any of them well. And none of these flavors can really shine and none of it really matches or goes together. And it's just this like complete hodgepodge of things the author thinks is cool, would be good to do, would be interesting to have, and just mush them all together in this like relatively short book where you just get zipped through and info dumped at. And it's just a mess, in my opinion. It's an absolute mess, <laughs> which is unfortunate because individually, any of these, any of the myriad things in this book could make for a great, interesting, compelling, fascinating, unique story. But none of it is allowed to breathe or shine or impress you because it is just completely crowded with all of this other stuff. And there's so many baffling choices in terms of like the narrative structure or in terms of, um, is it narrative structure? Like, a, so I don't think this is super spoilery. The book starts out with the main character as a child and then later on in that person's life, for magical reasons, um, there is like memories are taken away and then those memories return. And so you already know the memories like because you've seen this person's life from the beginning. So you know what it is that they have been now magically made to forget. So there's no mystery to that. And then they get their memories back anyway. So it's not something that they have to really deal with that long term. 
So it's stuff like that where I'm like, what? Why? Usually when you have like a memory loss type thing, not always, there's, there can be different reasons for that in stories, but like a lot of the time it'll be because you, the reader, also don't know because you're on this journey with this character who doesn't have their memories and the mystery is what is it they have forgotten? But you know what it is they've forgotten. And it's not, doesn't, it doesn't create interesting new narrative possibility when you know something that they don't know and they're doing things based on incomplete information. It's nothing like that, which could be interesting. It's nothing like that. It's, it's just, it's so surface level on all of this stuff all of the time because there just isn't room to delve into any of it because there's just too, too many things. So it's unfortunate, it really is. And this cover is gorgeous. I wish I liked this book because this is so pretty. There were also a few things in it that I thought were like, not offensive and not like full on problematic, but I was like, um, I don't know what that, I don't know how I feel about that. Like the, like there's an ace character, I guess. I guess it's an ace character, but the way that that it like, reveal is done the way the inclusion is done i was just like um okay and then there are just things to do with the sort of like social structure like that they're questionable and just the beginning of the stories there are a few things in this book that i was like ah, that's that's a little weird i don't know why we did it like that <laughs> okay so anyway oh uh, yeah I, I don't recommend unfortunately. Next up is another book that I binged, listened to when I was sick, and that was A Lady's Guide to Etiquette and Murder. This was actually sent to me by one of my patrons because I had recently put it on my wish list, and my patron was like, this seems like good light fun to recover or to read while recovering, which it was, but I was not recovered enough yet to physically read a book. So I listened to this as well. I got it off from the library. And it was cute. It was a little, you know, murder mystery that was sort of like Regency era murder mystery. And overall, it was pleasant and I had a good time. The mystery was interesting. It was kind of reminiscent to me uh, of Pride and Premeditation in terms of like the time period and it being a mystery, but I think Pride and Premeditation is better. It's quite a bit better. But that one also has the luxury of having the bones of Pride and Prejudice to work with, which is an all-time classic. So <laughs> this one's on its own. I uh, have seen, I think I saw that the third book in the series, because this is a series, all the books are Lady's Guide to Something and Something and they're all mysteries. I think the third one won an award. Um, and this was, you know, light, interesting, fun. It was such a fun little escapist Regency mystery. I had a good time. So I would read more of these, especially if the third one got an award, that bodes well. I wouldn't say like rush to read this, but like if you also are looking for just a light, quick read for a day, um, this might hit the spot. Next is another book that I listened to while I was sick. And that was My Sister the Serial Killer by uh, Oyen Khan Braithwaite, which again, I talked about this in the vlog where I was reading this uh, and I was sick. <laughs> this is a book that I'd meant to read for quite some time and I finally did and I really enjoyed it. It's, it is a thriller, but not a mystery, if that makes sense. Because you know who the killer is, it's the sister. <laughs> That is just not a whodunit, but it is nevertheless a thriller because you know you're it is very tense having a sister that is a serial killer So it was just more of an interesting examination of family dynamics and sister dynamics and of like Women's struggles in a man's world and it had a lot of interesting sort of food for thought and was presented in this sort of Unique way where the uh, your sister is a serial killer and it kind of like this is nothing like Dexter But like because I've been watching Dexter somewhat recently like it kind of put me in mind of Dexter like the idea that you're enabling a serial, like you're knowingly enabling a serial killer who is a family member uh, is kind of basically what Dexter's dad does for him. But it would be kind of like reading or watching Dexter from the perspective of the father, which is basically what this is. Anyway, I do recommend this. I had a really good time reading it. Um, but it is pretty unlike anything else that I've ever read before. Next up, I read the third book in the Sword of Truth series for the read-along that Methany and I are hosting, The Blood of the Fold by Terry Goodkind. This book, I think, is pretty forgettable in the this series, because even though it was been a while since I read these books, for most of them, I can remember a sort of basic outline of the major plot events and like who the big bad is in it and what generally the adventure is about and like some key moments. And it, even though it's been some time, I can do that for most of the books. With this one, I was like, I do not remember what Blood of the Fold is about. And now when we reread it, me and Bethany were like, yeah, because like, what even is this book about? It feels, even though this is like an ongoing series where each book is more episodic than an ongoing series, nevertheless, this feels like a middle book, like in a trilogy. Uh, it feels like the middle book between Stone of Tears, the second one, and Temple of the Winds, the fourth one. This is like a the gap book, the connecting tissue book. So it doesn't really have much of a plot of its own. It really doesn't. It has some interesting things for the world building and interesting character developments and just... There are things in it that we consider... that we enjoy a lot. And the writing is definitely better um, than the first... The first book's writing is the worst of the lot, just hands down. His writing is a lot better after that. So the writing is definitely better than the first book, but we talked about the first book, you know, has the more 
clear plot arc. So if we could get like the writing quality of Blood of the Fold, but with like the plot of Wizard's First Rule, you'd have a pretty great book. This is, the writing itself is better, but there really isn't a plot in this. <laughs> it's like resolving things from the second book and then setting things up for the fourth book, but it itself isn't doing a whole lot for itself. <laughs> so it's, it's fine. We, and we talked about it and, um, and yeah, that's, yeah. If you missed the live show, it was on Bethany's channel. I'll leave that linked down below. Oh, and I did go on a bit of a soapboxing rant towards the end of the live. So, you know, if you like to see me rant, um, then you should check out the live for that. Next up is the book that the vlog that I keep mentioning was actually meant to be for in its entirety. And that is The Alice Six by Olivia Blake. Now, if you watch that vlog, you'll know that I was reading it on my Kindle uh, because I had an e-arc of the new version and I liked it, which spoilers for the end of that vlog, I liked the book. So I decided to get the physical copy. One, because I was like, I liked it. So I would like to have a physical copy, but I was in no real rush to get one. Cause I was like, but I mean, I've read it and like, I'll get one at some point. But then I learned that there are illustrations and I wanted it. And I have looked through some of the illustrations and the illustrations are quite good. I mean, like, it's so cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, I really enjoyed this book. I don't think it's like the best book of all time. It is no Jade City, but I had a really good time reading this and I definitely intend to read the Atlas Paradox, I believe is the second one. And the, these new covers, um, I originally thought that I liked the, the self-pub cover better. And parts of it I do like better. I think that the like design of the glyph thingy on the original cover is cooler. This is pretty simplistic looking. I like the original glyph better, but the gold and black is all very nice. I wish it looked was gold and black, but it had the original design of the like symbol thing that was from the original cover, but like in gold. Anyway, yeah, I really enjoyed this. And um, yeah, if you wanna see my full thoughts, then that vlog, which was originally meant to be just about this, it's available to you. Next up is another book that Hillary chose for me. So you will have to tune in to find out what I thought about it. And that is, This Is How You Lose the Time War by Max Gladstone. It is a novella and um, yeah, just have to watch and find out. Waffo. Next up is the book that my patrons and I buddy read and that was Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. Uh, this was a reread for me and I still gave it four stars. But reading it this time, you know, I knew what I was in for. I've mentioned before that for very spoilery reasons, what she does towards the end of the book, like made me dock at a full star. But like knowing, I knew that going into it this time, what where this was all going. So it was interesting to sort of see everything now that I knew how it was going to end. And I, I was used to that idea now of how things are gonna go. I had had all these years to adjust to that idea. So like reading it now being like, okay, so if that's what this is actually gonna be, now that I know that I cannot be freshly betrayed by that. So, okay. So it was interesting seeing all the pieces that um, how that all fits together. I'm like, it works like the way that it was intended by the author and not what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I still enjoyed it. I still gave it four stars. Obviously the mystery and wonder of it is a little bit not there as much the second time because like, you know, the answer that it can't be such a mystery, but it is one of the most beautifully written things ever. Lainey Taylor's writing is just pure poetry. I, oh, it's, it's just gorgeous. And it's not just, uh, she writes beautifully in terms of like the meaning of the words, you know, the, the images that she paints in your mind with how she describes things is beautiful. But also the sound of words, like this, the words that she invents for her world, she invents painfully beautiful meanings for them, but also the sound of them is beautiful itself. Like words like the Almuthaleth, which is uh, a place where um, she does this thing where each like part of the book um, opens with the, with a invented in-universe word and its definition. So the first one is Shrest, Sh shrestha, um, which is when a dream comes true, but not for the dreamer. It's a beautiful sounding word that you can barely pronounce. <laughs> and the meaning of it is, I mean, well, let me read the rest. So the word, let me try again, is shrestha, noun. When a dream comes true, but not for the dreamer. Archaic, from Shres, the bastard god of fortune, who was believed to punish supplicants for inadequate offerings by granting their heart's desire to another. Just like the book is filled with stuff like that where it's just, oh, it's just, I don't have words for it because she used all the good words. Like I don't have better words to describe what that was. <laughs> that was magic. So anyway, I had a great time rereading this. I'm very much looking forward to reading Music of Nightmares, which when I did read it the first time, I gave it full five stars. Uh, no, no docking of stars occurred. So I'm hoping I still feel that way on reread. But anyway, Strange the Dreamer is gorgeous. Read it if you haven't. Next up is another book that Hillary picked for me. And that is The Paper Menagerie by Ken Liu. And you'll just have to 
Watch and find out what I thought of it. And last but not least is another book of the month club book that um, I just, you know, was on my back list and I had time. And that was The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna. My whole for it came in, so I uh, got it. And it won book of the year for book of the month in 2021. Uh, that's why I have it too, because if you're a book of the month club subscriber, the end of the year, in addition to whatever book you pick for the month, you get to pick for free their finalists for book of the month or book of the year. Um, so the finalists last year of the five finalists, I think it's five of the five finalists that there were, the ones that I was most interested in, I had already bought and read them as my books of the month. So of the remaining ones that I had not read yet, the one that I was most interested in was The Four Winds. I wasn't interested enough to pick it for my book of the month ever, but um, I picked it when I could get it for free. It is, it's a story about the, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression, which, you know, is very sad. And it was, it was, it was a good story. And I, it was very heart wrenching at times and heartfelt and well written and very compellingly written. But I gave it four stars instead of five because having quite recently read books that also told uh, true events or fictionalized versions of true events, it didn't, the writing wasn't as deeply poignant as the writing in those other books. So I, I think it's quite good. I gave it four stars and I would recommend it. And it is a part of history that we don't actually talk that much about. Like we think talk about World War II, but we don't really talk about the Dust Bowl that much. Like it's not a fun topic to make movies out of and to discuss. And it was like, it was really horrible. Um, and it was, it was actually one of the most interesting things about this was the interview with the author at the end of the book where she kind of talked about how when she decided to write this book, obviously she had no way of knowing how hyper relevant a lot of the things in this book would become by the time it came out because there's this sort of like isolation of having to stay in your house because of the depression and the Dust Bowl, um, which because of coronavirus, then we were all living that. And then the all the stories in the news about immigrants and, and migrant workers and about border issues and the fact that it was people from the center of America, from the Dust Bowl, immigrating, uh, emigrating, moving to the coasts. And they were treated pretty much the same way that migrant workers are treated. Um, but they were not immigrants. But it was just like true then and it's true now and history repeating itself and just like both the great, like the good and the bad of humanity being true then and true now, basically. So like the strength and the resilience and the courage of the people that lived through this, as well as the horrifying ways that people took advantage of those situations or mistreated people or withheld help and, and demonized and discriminated and punished them for things that were beyond their control. So it, yeah, basically like it was, yeah, when the author said that this book was a lot more relevant than she ever could have predicted that it would be, I was like, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> So from that perspective, like even though it may not, it may not strike you as like, oh, a book about the Dust Bowl, that's hyper relevant for the times. It actually is. Um, and the like climate itself being, a, you know, like the, the Dust Bowl was basically a man-made crisis. And then so therefore humans had to fix it. All of that makes this like an oddly topical book. So, I mean, it, it is really good. Um, it's not amazing, but it's quite good. And those are all the books that I read in March. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays. Other end times will be up on Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.